Markov chains, a concept that we very lightly touched upon in a previous episode of Friday Minis. We briefly explained in that episode that Markov chains actually drive the autocorrect or dictionary feature on your cell phone, but, well, there is a little bit more to be said about Markov chains than that. And that is exactly what we're going to be looking at in today's Random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So today we're going to be taking a look at Markov chains. We're going to begin by actually understanding the theory behind it. Well, a little bit of the theory at least, minus all the math. And then we're actually going to try and implement it. So let us begin by understanding what a Markov chain even is in the first place. Here's the deal. As we've spoken about in, you know, the previous episode of Friday Minis, the idea is that there are a bunch of states and you want to transition between one to the other. The transitions between these states are probabilistic in nature. And what that means is, well, one state can transition to multiple other states with different amounts of probabilities. And that's basically what a Markov chain is. Its entire responsibility is to model such behavior. What this of course means is that application-wise, this goes beyond your phone's autocorrect feature. It can be used for a lot of things, like, well, research, you know, in areas like speech and music recognition. It can be used in things like games, where you actually, you know, create the AI of enemies. And even if we just limit ourselves to the domain of text generation, it still has a lot of applications, from parody accounts to, well, screenwriting. There is actually a movie written by a Markov chain. So yeah, with this preamble out of the way, basically the rest of the episode is going to be split into two parts. First, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of run through the theory, let's try to understand the fundamentals as thoroughly as we possibly can, and then we're gonna apply it. We're gonna write our own, you know, very simplified Markov chain for text generation. So yeah, hopefully that sounds like a fun thing to do. Without further ado, let's jump into part one. So we know that Markov chains are finite state machines, you know, exactly like this, and that's all well and good. But how do we even get here in the first place? To better understand this, we're gonna have to take a step back to sort of get an understanding of the underlying principle behind a Markov chain. First and foremost, a Markov chain is actually a machine learning technique. In other words, it is a form of artificial intelligence. What this means is, you're going to actually have to give a Markov chain a whole bunch of data for it to learn from before it can actually perform the functions it's supposed to do. That's the whole point of machine learning. In fact, when you actually give it data to refer to, it is then able to generate your finite state machine. Only then can you use the finite state machine to generate sentences. Hopefully that gives you a better idea, but let's take a look at a very simple example. So here's the deal. Let's say we start off with a clean slate like this, and then we supply our first text input. Say, roses are red. Why not? What your software needs to do is to actually read in these terms and split up the terms into individual states then they'll have to be connected such that you can actually transition from one state to another and you actually record down the probability. Of course, in this case, since this is all the information we know, well, roses can only transition to R, which is why the probability is 1. The same applies to R and red. These terms can only transition from one to the other. Let's change things up, make things more exciting by supplying the new phrase Violets are blue. Now, when you actually insert that into the graph, you notice something interesting. The model we have here has now seen the term R two times, and it has noticed that at one point of time, R transitions to red. At another point of time, R actually transitions to blue instead. And that is why the probabilities now become 50-50. So basically, that's how you actually generate a Markov chain. Each time you insert new inputs, it is sort of overlaid on top of the older inputs, and probabilities are tweaked as necessary. At any point of time, we can say, alright, let's take the model we have and use it to generate some sentences. So let's do that right here. We pick a random starting point, 
and in this case we've found the term violet. Now, in this case, because the probability here is 1, violets can only transition to R. But once we've hit R, there's a 50-50 chance between blue and red, and you know, there's nothing to stop you from going to red. Hence, we've generated the term violets are red, which as we know isn't true, but according to this model, well, it's entirely possible. That in essence is actually how you build up a Markov chain and how you use it to generate sentences. Of course, this is a very simplified example. When we actually use real Markov chains, what we end up creating are huge graphs. And in fact, this still isn't very huge. But the point is, if we want to generate something, we can start anywhere and sort of just follow the arrows. Notice what I've done with this particular graph. The arrows can actually loop in among themselves and yeah, this allows you to generate a sentence of infinite length, if you so desire. So yeah, basically using this as you know a basic concept as to how Markov chains actually work, we can now begin to actually build our own Markov chain software. So yeah, that is the theory, at least the most fundamental part. I've left out all the math because frankly, I don't understand it either. But let's actually, you know, jump on and try to implement our own Markov chain. Now, do bear in mind that what we are about to do is extremely simplified. There are many ways to actually make it better, make it more thorough, and make it more correct. But what we're gonna get at the end of the day is something that, well, actually works. So yeah, with that in mind, let's jump into the code. So let us begin this process by having a thorough understanding of what we're going to be doing. Basically for this project, we're going to be writing two programs. First, one to actually learn from your input and to generate your Markov chain, and another to actually generate text based on the Markov chain. These two programs don't run at the same time, which is why in order for them to communicate with each other, a dictionary file is going to have to be created. We're going to be writing these two modules in Python, but the dictionary file that is going to be shared is going to be a JSON file. This of course makes it easy for us to actually port this over to HTML JavaScript later on if we ever wanted to create a GUI. The dictionary file works like this. Basically, we have a bunch of words. These words will lead to a set of next words. And on top of that, we'll associate each one of these words with a frequency of occurrence. Notice that previously when we explained Markov chains, we actually explained it in terms of probabilities. In this case, we're not going to be doing that because, well, that is a little bit harder to compute. Instead, what's going to happen is we're just going to keep track of how often one word leads to another word. And then we will update the frequency as we need. Since this file is going to be in a JSON format, well, it could look something like this. And this, in fact, is the same data we looked at earlier on. As you can see, the three words our system knows are roses, R, and violets. And you can see that roses leads to R, violets also leads to R, whereas the word R could lead to red or blue. And we've encountered each one of these exactly once. And that is essentially how this works. The roles and responsibilities of the learning module are as such. First, we want to get inputs from the user somehow, be it via the console input or from a file. We are only going to be looking at one of these, namely the console. Next, we're going to actually attempt to, you know, package up our inputs, process it, and add it to the dictionary file. Of course, in order to do this, we're going to have to handle several different contingencies. First and foremost, what if the dictionary file doesn't even exist? Well, we'll have to handle that. We'll have to see if the word has been inserted into the dictionary before, and you know whether it is or it isn't, we've got to handle it differently. If it is, we still have to check to see if that particular word pair has been encountered before. So yeah, there are actually several different cases we have to handle, and we will see it as we move along. The way we invoke this program is to actually give it a dictionary name as well as an input name. What this means is, the dictionary, of course, is our JSON file, and well, we're gonna set a default for it in case it's not supplied. And of course, if the input is actually a text file, then the file name needs to be supplied as well. So with this in mind, let's jump into the coding. Now, let's be good and actually write this from the top down. 
So yeah, let's begin by actually reading in our arguments. So from our main function, we call a function called read arguments, and that's going to return the two files we've mentioned just now. Of course, writing this isn't too hard. We need to actually be able to read the command line parameters that are being supplied to the program. Per usual convention, the first parameter is actually the name of the program itself. And of course, because this is an array, it is item zero, which is actually why I perform a subtraction here because, well, we can sort of ignore this. By keeping track of the length of, you know, the number of inputs, I can actually see how many of these optional inputs are being supplied. I begin by setting up my defaults, of course, input file defaults to nothing. And then I simply check the number of arguments. If there is at least one argument, of course, excluding the name of the program itself, that means the name of the dictionary has been supplied. And so we read it in from the parameter. Same idea for this. If we get a second argument, then let's read it in. Once done, we return both values. Going back to our main function, the next thing we're going to have to do is to actually read the dictionary of the dictionary file. Now, there is a chance that we are actually trying to edit an older dictionary file, which is why this step is necessary. But what I also do within this is to check and see if the file actually exists. If it doesn't, I'll take this opportunity to actually create that file. The way I do this is pretty simple. I simply open the file for writing and dump an empty object into the file. This sets up our JSON file and allows us to work with it in the future. So when this bit is done, we of course continue to actually opening the file. We read off whatever data structure we can get out of the JSON file, close the file, and basically return the data structure we've collected. We move on once again going back to our main function. Now, if the input file has not been specified, we will enter an interactive mode. Otherwise, we simply read from the file. Let's focus our attentions on the first condition. Basically, all we have to do is to ask the user for inputs. So that's what the raw input function in Python does. Of course, since this is the interactive mode, we're going to want to do this many times. And that is why I put the entire chunk in a while loop. That is also why I have this little block here. If the user supplies no inputs, then we can actually jump out and terminate the program. Otherwise, if there has been some input, then we send it along to a learn function. We pass in the dictionary object so that the function can work on the existing dictionary. And when it's done, when it's finished changing up this dictionary, it should return it. So hopefully I'm still making sense. Let's take a look at the learn function. First and foremost, we'll be using the split function to split up the entire string into individual words. That of course is why I'm splitting on the space. Then we basically want to run a loop from the first word to the second last word. And the reason why it's the second last and not the last is because within the loop itself, we will be looking at each word as well as the word that comes after it. That's why we don't want to run this for the last word because of course this term goes out of bounds. So right, we have this, let's continue on. Now, essentially, this is the key learning process. It looks a bit complex, so let's break it down. And in fact, let's break it down in terms of that diagram we've looked at earlier on. Let's start with the first condition. What this is saying is that the current word has not appeared in the dictionary before. What this means is that there isn't even a root entry like this. Since we don't have this, Obviously, we also don't have any next words leading up from this keyword. And that's why, well, it's kind of simple. We add the current word to the dictionary and we say that, well, it has been encountered before this word and this has happened once. This, of course, registers the entire set of information. Of course, this doesn't always happen. If a word has been encountered before, then, well, we expect that there is some entry within the data structure. Now, after this, there are still two conditions. If the next word has actually not been encountered before, then we actually have to make a new entry like this. Of course, the frequency must be initialized to one. This statement here adds a new entry like this. Let's look at the last condition. Basically, everything already exists. We've seen this word before, and we've also seen the next word come after it before. 
Therefore, all we have to do is to read out the existing frequency, increment it, and then assign it right back. So yeah, these are the three different ways in which we can actually add words to the dictionary. Zooming out a little, this is the entire learn function, so the whole set of conditionals we have been looking at fits right here. Of course, no matter what we do, we actually change up the dictionary, which is why we should of course return it at the end of the day. Jumping back to our main function, we of course want to update the file as well. This isn't very hard, we just have to open the file for writing, do a JSON dump of the dictionary into the file, and we're done. And in fact, essentially we are done. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to actually talk about the reading from file part. Let's leave that aside for now and stick in a not yet implemented statement there. This is actually needed because, well, the program doesn't run if you don't do that. Don't forget also that because we've actually written everything in functions, if you try to run it, nothing will happen. At the very end of the file, stick in a main function. And once you've done that, your program should run as expected. Let's actually give it a try and see how it turns out. So as you can see, well, the program is running, and the moment it runs, it creates the dictionary file as we expect. When we open it, we see an empty JSON object. All is well, let's give our program some input. Let's type in roses are red and return to our dictionary to see that everything has been set up as expected. Of course, everything is in one line at the moment, but hopefully it's not too hard to visualize that everything is indeed correct. Let's now go ahead and add our second statement. Once again, we return to our JSON file to see it has been updated again. And yeah, everything is working just nice. Now, let's just push this a little bit to make sure that, you know, our last condition is working as well by adding in a new statement. Tulips are red. Reviewing our JSON file again, you of course notice the most critical change. The word R leads to red, but the frequency is now 2. Your Markov chain has seen the word red coming after the word R twice now. So alright, let us begin writing our text generation module. Now, this one is actually pretty straightforward. Basically, well, you want to do all these steps. And essentially, all this is doing is finding some random position in the finite state machine to begin with, and just traversing for as far as you possibly can. Now, most of these steps are fairly straightforward, but steps like this will be a little bit challenging. Similar to the previous parts, there are some different conditions in which you have to look out for. Same deal for step number 2, which you'll encounter both at the beginning as well as at random points while the program is running, and that is to actually find a new random spot in the finite state machine. This happens both at the beginning as well as when you actually traverse along and you run into a dead end. The command call is fairly straightforward. Essentially, we only need to take in two different parameters. The first being how much output we actually want to generate, while the second points us towards the dictionary file. So without further ado, let's jump into the code. We are of course also going to write this from the top down, and that's why we will begin with a read arguments function. Now, this isn't too different from what we've seen in the previous part. We set up some defaults, then we calculate the number of arguments that are available. Depending on the length, we'll take in as many pieces of input as we need. In the end, we simply return those values. The only thing we do differently here is that the first parameter, a number, must be cast to an integer. If we don't do this, the number comes out as a string and we can't use it for calculations later. So yeah, just a minor point that you should take note of. So going back to our main function, our next order of business is to actually load up the dictionary. This can actually be copied and pasted from the previous part, but we do want to actually change up a little something here. Instead of actually attempting to create the file if it doesn't exist, we simply throw an error and exit. The reason for this is, well, since this particular program isn't responsible for generating the file in the first place, then we don't have to bother. This is the more correct way of handling it in the context of this program. Let us now bring our attention back to the main function where we have now added some things. Now, let's very quickly break down what's happening here. First, the way in which we will actually generate words is to give this function 
the previous word that was generated, as well as, of course, the dictionary, and it will use that to generate a new word. Of course, when we are done doing all our computation, we have to update the last word variable accordingly. We start with something random, something that we are unlikely to encounter at the very beginning, so that, well, when you actually go into this function, it will see that this isn't a valid last word, and it will randomly pick a new one. So in fact, the getNextWord function also has that functionality. Of course, each time we run these three steps, we generate one word. Since a string length has been supplied, well, we run it for as many times as we've asked for. Of course, since we're generating all our outputs word by word, we will have to create a new results variable and to actually concatenate all our results together. At the end of the day, we're going to have to print this out. So let's go ahead and jump into the most important function. This function works on two big conditions. First, if the last word was actually not present in the dictionary, then, well, this implies that we are at a dead end, and we will have to pick a new random state to start from. Of course, if that's not the case, then we're not done traversing, and we can continue to do so. Responding to the first condition is actually fairly simple. All we have to do is to pick a random word from the dictionary. But, well, we're going to write an external function to do this. Of course, once we have that word, we simply return it. Jumping into the pick random function, essentially, we look at a dictionary, we count how many words there are in there, and generate a random number. This statement here basically allows us to pick the word corresponding to the random number that we've generated. And when we get back this word, we can simply return it. So hopefully that wasn't too hard, let us now move on to the more interesting part of the program, which is to, well, actually traverse our finite state machine. Now, this is pretty complex, so let's take a look at several pictures first. Now, imagine this is one chunk inside of the JSON document, and well, this is the word such, which is followed up by several different words with several different frequencies. The challenge here is, how are we actually going to use a random number generator to pick certain words, such that certain words actually have a higher probability than others? What I'm about to show you is a very flawed, but very straightforward way of doing this, and that is to simply create an array holding every single term, as often as it occurs here. Just think about this, if you were to pick an item randomly from this list, it is the same as saying we want to pick certain terms with a higher probability. Because, well, you'll notice that picking one out of these eight items will make picking one of these three items more likely than, say, this item. So yeah, that's the idea we're going to use. We're going to generate a new array and then simply randomly pick one item out of the array. So once again, going back to this code, the way we're going to do it is like this. First, we take a look at all the candidates that can be produced, and that of course means this part of the data structure. And well, we're also going to create a new array called candidates normalized, and this will be the big array you've seen just now. Then we're going to loop through each one of these words, and we're going to pick out the frequency of that particular word. We're going to loop for as many times as that number says, and for each iteration, we simply append that word into our large normalized array. So yeah, once this large loop actually completes, we will have constructed our huge normalized array. All that's left to do would be to actually generate a random number, you know, based on the length of this large array, and then simply pick out the word from the array. So in fact, we are done with this part. Going back to the main function, don't forget to actually print out the results that has been collected. And of course, don't forget to add a main function call to the very end of your program. But yeah, once we're done with these two things, we're done with the entire program. Let's now give it a run and see if it works as we expect. So alright, let us go ahead and run our program here with say 12 words. I'm not going to put in the dictionary name since we already have that by default. But yeah, when we run it, we do have some kind of semi-coherent statement. Now, here's the deal you realize that, well, much of it isn't particularly impressive, and the reason for that is because our dictionary is extremely small. Of course, as your dictionary grows larger, you can expect better performance. 
Of course, it might not be easy for you to generate enough content to do that, which is why one simple way to work around this is to actually just train your Markov chain on an ebook. You can get loads of free ebooks on Project Gutenberg at gutenberg.org. So yeah, give that a go and watch your Markov chain spit out some, well, not too shabby sentences. And there you have it, that is our Markov chain. Now, as mentioned, this is extremely simplified. There are many things that you can do to make it work better and, you know, quicker. But yeah, hopefully what we've done today sort of gives you a very general idea of how Markov chains actually work and how you can write your own. And yeah, it's not actually that difficult to write. Well, the fundamentals at least. That's all there is for this Random Wednesday episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.